few things going on in the sky that are of interest. Let's have a go here. First of all, our good friend, the sun, is as blank as anything. There is nothing at all visible on the sun. And there has not been, actually I did this on Monday, so it's now 272 days um, so far this year have been completely spotless. And that is a record. Um, not quite a record forever and ever, but a record held since 1913, when there were, there were 311 spot-free days in 1913, and no other year since has, uh, has surpassed 272. Um, and unfortunately, there are not enough days left in this year um, to beat the 1913 record. But uh, um, So really, solar cycle 24, 25 um, is coming into a very deep minimum. Um, let's have a little look at that. This is, this is the forecast. Um, um, so here's uh, 23. Now, 23 was a... Let me just make sure I press the right button. There we are. Uh, right, 23 was quite a big cycle, and there were some good auroras in 2003 or so, towards the end of that. Um, 24, not quite so big, smaller cycle. And actually, this here, this minimum, 23, 24, was a very deep one, um, deepest in recent times. But this one is being even deeper. Um, and it will, they're saying now that this will roughly bottom out, if it hasn't already, um, April 2020, they're saying, would be the, the complete bottom of that by prediction. And then 25, actually, you'd have thought, wouldn't you, that maybe that would be even a smaller peak than 24, but they're saying roughly about the same sort of size. Um, but we have to wait and see on that because there's plenty of uh, variation in this. It could be give or take, you know, quite a bit. 115 minus, plus or minus 10, they say. So there could be quite a lot of variation in that. It might be a smaller peak than solar cycle 24. But the surety is that we're pretty much near the bottom of things now. So... Um, we'll keep an eye on our, our nearest star. It's, it's all very interesting. Uh, there's other stars, of course. Um, oh, there's, there's the evening star. There's Venus. Um, just there is now quite visible um, shortly after sunset. It's very low, um, but uh, you do get it. It's bright enough you get it just after sunset. And I did have it actually with Saturn just there a couple of nights before. This is taken from our uh, dark site we have in Larn called ASDA. And, and, that's, and, that, and that's what all this is about here. <laughs> but uh, I, just, I just happened to be there and pulled the camera out of my pocket and goes, oh, look, there's Venus on top of the hill. And uh, so that's, uh, that's Venus. It's getting better. It will be quite bright in the first few months um, of the new year. Um, that gives you a better sort of view of it. That's a Stellarium view. Um, 16.30, a half past four in the evening. Now the sun is gone. Saturn is just about there somewhere. It would, be, it would take an eagle eye and a pair of binoculars, I think, to find Saturn now. Um, because it did pass Venus um, a week or so ago, and uh, it's now sinking down behind the sun, whereas Venus is on the way up. Um, in the morning, if you get up early in the morning, you don't have to get up that early in the morning, because even five past eight is still well before sunrise. Um, Mars is quite easy to find. Mercury is very, very hard to find. It is there. It's not the best apparition of Mercury. Um, but you could see Mercury and join the 1% of the population of the world who've seen it. Um, but uh, we are not really in the right place to, to actually see that. Just on the, on the matter of um, times of day and stuff, uh, the solstice this year is not the 21st, it's the 22nd. Um, 4.19, I think, in the morning is the actual time of it. Um, it's because next year is a leap year, and then it changes a day, and it comes back to the 21st next year. Um, but that's, although that is the shortest day, and it's about 7 hours and 40-something minutes here, uh, of daylight. Um, it is not, uh, it is neither the latest, sorry, the, the earliest sunset, which was actually um, last week, it was the 14th, was the, uh, was the date of the earliest, earliest, yeah, earliest sunset. Um, and the latest sunrise is not until the 30th of December, um, which is about 10 to 9, something like that. So uh, they are asymmetric and it's all to do with the Earth's orbit around the sun being elliptical. Um, the geometry just means that they're not, um, they're not, they don't all happen on the same day. Um, oh, why has my white turned to black? How strange is that? Um, I got home from the election night the other night. Um, I wasn't on the overnight crew, but I was on the, on the late shift. And uh, there was actually a fairly clear sky there. And I was sort of looking at the sky. Had a big bright moon in it, which makes things a bit more difficult. But I was looking at Orion. And I always look at Orion because 
um, you know, that one of these days Betelgeuse is going to explode, so they told me. And, uh, and every sort of August or September when I first see Orion in the sky, I look carefully at Betelgeuse and go, is that brighter than Rigel? Um, and, uh, and at the moment, it absolutely is not, because um, it's got much dimmer in the last month or so. Um, normally, Rigel and Betelgeuse, you can look at them and say, well, they're about the same, and if anything, Betelgeuse is a bit less. Um, Betelgeuse is actually called Alpha Orionis, which kind of suggests to me that at some stage it was brighter than Rigel, because um, that's how they name uh, stars and constellations. But, but, uh, but now... It's, right, it's a variable star. It's got at least two cycles, and some say about four. Um, one of being, the, the main one being 420 days, um, um, the other being five to six years. But then there's a shorter variation as well of 180 days, and some say there's a long cycle of 50 years or something like that. Now, it could be they've all come together, or it could be that something else has happened to Betelgeuse. But I estimated its magnitude as somewhere between 1 and 1 1.2. Um, just looking at Rigel, and looking at Bellatrix next to it, which is 1.6, and going, well, it's brighter than Bellatrix, but probably a bit closer to Bellatrix than it is to Rigel. So I thought 1 to 1.2, and then I was quite pleased that I found a source on the internet where they'd actually measured it with a machine that said it was 1.12, so can't get better than that. Um, but we don't really know what's happening. It's either the star is contracting, which could be headed towards supernova, because that's what happens, but I'd be surprised. I mean, I do, you, know, you can't get that lucky, really, can you? But, uh, um, because they sort of think, well, sometime between 100,000 to a million years is really when that's going to happen. But uh, it might just be dust. It might even just have thrown out some dust. But Betelgeuse is dimmer than it was this time last year, is the certain thing I can tell you. Um, we can see that. This is, um, this is actually some records that were taken. Um, obviously, this guy only sees Betelgeuse half of the year, but taken all these. This is the last nine years we're looking at here. And everything's nice and steady around 0.5 magnitude or so until we get to here. And then it just plummets. That, and that is where we are now, below magnitude one, just there. This is a photograph of Betelgeuse taken with a, um, one of the um, millimeter array telescope sets. Because um, actually, Betelgeuse is, although it's a long way away, it's 640 light years away, it is huge. Indeed, here is the orbit of Jupiter superimposed on that. The orbit of Saturn would be outside the star, but we would most certainly be well in it. And it is very uneven as well. You can, you can actually see darker and lighter areas on Betelgeuse through that kind of photographic image. So if it does go bang, big if, no promises, um, it would be visible in broad daylight. It is far enough away that we'd be safe, or so we believe, it's not going to tear the atmosphere off the Earth or anything like that. Um, but it would be as bright as a full moon and visible during full daylight and everything. So it would be quite a spectacle if, if, if it happens. Um, but I don't think it is there. I think it's just dust or something. Sorry to disappoint. There are, just uh, over the Christmas period, a couple of meteor showers worth looking at. Again, my whites have gone to black. Does anyone know why that happens? <laughs> That used to be white text, honest. Um, the Ursids meteor shower, they run from the 17th, i.e. yesterday, um, until the 28th of December, or thereabouts. And the radiant here is near the, is near the orange star Kokab. That's pole star here. You've got the, you've got the plough here. Two pointers here. Pole star, Kokab, the orange star, the, really the only other one that's bright in, in, in the, the Little Dipper and the radiant is near there. So, as always, with meteor showers, you don't want to be looking there, you want to be looking away from that radiant. So, looking in the plough would be good. P pointing a camera at the plough would be a good, uh, a good exercise there. Um, so that's the, um, the Ursids. The other meteor shower coming up over the Christmas New Year period is uh, this one here, the Quadrantids. Similar sort of area, actually, just along from... Uh, from the radiant that we just looked at there with the Ursids. Uh, this is just in the constellation Bootes. It's off the end of the Big Dipper. This is your radiant here. So again, if you pointed a camera in the direction of the plough, you may well pick up um, uh, quadranted meteors. And again, my text has gone nuts here. Um, now that has a, um, a period of activity from the 28th of December through to the 12th of January, but um, this shower would be almost as good as the Perseids and the Geminids, except for the fact it only lasts a couple of hours, really. The, the peak of it 
is round about two o'clock in the morning on the morning of the 4th of January, I, I say the night of the 3rd of January. If you get a clear sky there, point a camera towards the plough and uh, see if you pick up any, any quadranted meteors. Um, one other thing, what we'd really like is a nice Christmas comet, and, and the bad news I have for you is we're not getting one, um, as far as I can tell. But there is this one, um, Comet 17T2 Panstars. Um, now, this is a tenth magnitude comet at the minute. It is fairly conveniently located in a very dark bit of sky just to the, to, to the, uh, to the east of Perseus there. So down from Cassiopeia, um, not far from Capella, that sort of area. Um, but it's not anywhere near peak yet. It's expected to peak next May at about magnitude 7 or so. But as it's a comet, and comets are like cats, they have tails and do what they like. You can't really tell this far out. It could, it could explode into something much more interesting. It might be just another mediocre comet. So that's how we, how we look at that one. So that is uh, the comet. I think that's really what I've got to say about the stars. Yep. Um, now I'm going to just uh, mention we have two member speakers this evening. So the first talk, Adam Jeffers will be um, coming up in a moment and he'll be talking about deep sky astrophotography with a small telescope. Now Adam has been at this quite a while, um, about 10 or so years. Um, but it's more recently you've become a bit more active, Adam. I mean, it, uh, in the last couple of years, Adam's um, taken this quite seriously. And I'll tell you what, um, from Cookstown, I must move to Cookstown immediately because the skies there are absolutely fantastic. He's getting amazing photographs of, uh, of the night sky um, with, with, with a small telescope, quite a small setup. Um, Adam is a member of our council as well. Um, and he's also working with the Mid Ulster Council um, on the DAVA Dark Sky Project. So uh, it's got a fair uh, few fingers and a few pies there. So uh, let me introduce to you Adam Jeffers, and we'll get him set up here and started. Thank you.